Amen. All right. So um, I'm uh, in the book. We are in the book of Revelation. So let's jump into the Bible and uh, get on with our study in the time we have remaining. Revelation chapter two is where we are. We're looking at the seven churches. So we've covered uh, so far. We've covered two churches. So we're making some hay. Uh, we looked at Ephesus in Revelation two. Uh, verses 1 through 7. And then we looked at Smyrna, Revelation 2, 8 through, um, 8 through 11. Now we're going to be looking at Pergamos, Revelation 2, 12 through 17. So let's look at the Word of God. Let's open with God's Word. Keeping in mind that uh, this book is written to the, the, the seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, it, uh, you know, John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was caught up in the Spirit. And, uh, and so this is, there's revelation being revealed to the churches. We've been stewarding uh, this information for the last 2,000 years. And uh, these churches that were literal historical churches in Asia, but they also represent uh, seven church ages, which we've talked about in previous sessions. You can go back to the beginning at the intro and listen to that. And so we're on our third season and cycle, or, or third, not cycle, but our third um, our third uh, segment, I should say, of church history uh, called Pergamos, uh, after the church of Pergamos in Asia. So we'll start in verse 12. It says, The angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. Who, who might that be? Who has a sharp two-edged sword? Yeah, Jesus, right? He's got a sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 19, uh, Hebrews 5.12, right? So we know that. So this is coming from Jesus. He's downloading this right now. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou uh, also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that readeth it. And you say, well, what name is it? Well, I don't know, because I accept the person that reads it, so I don't know the name. So anyway, that's another. So anyway, um, so I want to just point out before I die, there's so much here I, I could just go on, but notice that just a couple things about the text, because once I get into our notes, it's, it, we're going to kind of go away from the text. So I want to just work in the text for just a few minutes uh, just kind of off the top of my, not off the top of my head, but just, just work the text and uh, before I jump into my notes and give you kind of some summary thoughts so that we can put our head around uh, not just what's going on historically, what he's referencing biblically, and that will help enlighten us to what we're going to see in our notes. This session on Pergamos could take me a couple weeks, so I'm just letting you know that, so keep hold of your notes. Uh, are there plenty of notes? Are there enough notes out there on the connections counter? Okay. So keep hold of those sheets. If we need more, we'll print more next week. But let's just start again at verse 1. We know that the Lord's talking. The sharp two-edged sword is the Word of God. We know that. I'm not going to take a lot of time on that. You can look up Hebrews uh, you know, 4.12. You can look up uh, Revelation uh, 19 and see that. Okay, verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Now, we're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. This was a church that did good works in the best sense of the word, Revel Ephesians 2.10. Even where, but he, this is what's important for this discussion, and I'll try to elaborate on this a little bit more in a moment. But we see here that Satan has a seat. Now that's interesting um, because a seat here, you know, does he have like a chair, like you're sitting in? You know, what are we talking about? Does anybody know what's what's he talking about? Satan's seat. Maybe you've been in some other courses or other classes I've taught, so you already know that. So if you know it, just just shout it out. Raise your hand. Nobody, you guys are afraid to talk out loud. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Satan has a seat of power or throne, uh, very, very much so in this case, and we're going to de delve into that. Uh, and so he's talking about Satan having a place, a seat of power. Now we all know from Ephesians, right, that, that we don't wrestle against 
flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan does have, have dominion in, in the places of principalities. Prince being the, the key word, princes, the rulers of this world. All right, so he's saying that this place, Pergamos, there's a place where Satan's seat is. There's a seat where Satan sits, and it's a powerful place. Um, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my face, uh, faith, denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So this is a place where Satan dwelleth. He has a place where he's dwelling. Um, well, where might this place be? Well, it's Pergamos. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so uh, he says, and then he gets into this discussion of a few things against thee, because thou, uh, thou hast therein then that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So now we have a doctrine, a doctrine. The word doctrine, what's the word doctrine mean? Teaching, right? It just means teaching. I was brought up before I was a Christian. The, the word doctrine was like a curse word, you know. My, uh, I won't, well, I will tell you. My dad used to, he said, all churches have their doctrine. But it wasn't that he said that. It was the way he said it. It made me think, man, doctrine must be horrible. Uh, because he basically said, well, I won't get into all that, but he was obviously burnt. And so uh, he'd been listening to too many Jehovah Witnesses at work, whatever. But at the end of the day, I thought doctrine was a bad thing. And then I started going to church and the preacher's up there talking about doctrine, doctrine. And I'm like, what is this? Am I in a cult? And, uh, and so I learned that doctrine just means teaching. And my dad was right. A lot of churches have their teaching. And so, and it's not all right. It's not all good. But it's not a bad thing because Jesus has his doctrine. Satan has his doctrine, right, his teaching. And so there's a synagogue of uh, Satan here. Um, there's a seat of Satan. And then there's, I'm sorry, there's a doctrine of uh, here that, talk, that uh, is, there is a synagogue of Satan. I'm not getting to that yet. But there's a, there's a doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we saw in chapter 2 and verse 6, there were deeds of Nicolaitans in, in the church at Ephesus. Now, two churches later, there is a, a doctrine. So their actions have now become part of the doctrine, the teaching. Okay? They're, they're, they're ruling over people. They're teaching a doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This is not pleasing the Lord Jesus, uh, so much so that he says, which thing I hate. Uh, so he hates this. If you go back, look at verse 6. This thou hast, that thou hatest Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. One of the good things about the church at Ephesus is they could identify the, the they identified uh, those that that had the deeds of Nicolaitans, and they put them out of business. They didn't support that. And Jesus says, "Good, I hate it too." Now that doesn't jive well with the Jesus that many people have today in our world. You know, Jesus doesn't hate anything. Well, Jesus does love people, but he hates Antichrist. Right? Uh, we just talked about that last Sunday. Uh, he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus is being abundantly clear about this doctrine that he hates. And then he tells them, of course, repent. Don't put up with it. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. But good news, there are those that overcome, and he's going to give them to eat of the hidden manna. And uh, in my Revelation study, I'll, I elaborate more on that. I'm not going to, if you want to learn more about that, go back to my Revelation study and go to the church of Pergamos and listen to everything I was saying there. But uh, that's enough to get us going. I wanted to mention, though, in verse 14, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there then that hold the doctrine of Balaam. So you also have the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, does it, can anyone summarize for me, other than Ron, what the doctrine of Balaam was? Because I remember reading through this. I'm like, what's the doctrine of Balaam? Yeah. The idolize, how did he do that, though? How did Balaam accomplish that? Right, right. What's that? Well, they did that eventually. Israel did that, yeah. But initially, that's not specific. Specifically, what did they do? Historically, in the book of Numbers. I see Mark peeking through the door. He knows what they did. <laughs> so, anybody know? Okay, so I'm not going to, I don't want to take the time for time's sake, but you can go back and read yourself in, um, in Numbers. Um, it's also mentioned in 2 Peter 2. But what happened is that, just to kind of summarize, uh, Balak wanted Balaam, the prophet, 
to, so you have religion. He wanted this, this, this ruler, Balak, wanted Israel to be cursed. So he gets a prophet. And this is, when I was a young Christian, I was reading this story. I read this in Revelation. I went back and I read this story. It is a little hard, just as a casual read, to kind of catch it, just casually reading it. You kind of got to stop and pray and say, Jesus, what is, what is going on with this story? Because it, it almost looks like Balaam's a great guy. He's, uh, he's saying, oh, I cannot say anything but what the Lord tells me to say. I will not curse God's people. And I'm like reading that going, well, that seems right, you know. And so without getting into the whole story, you'd have to read it. Um, uh, basically, this, this goes, this, these iterations go on. So Balak is saying, hey, go curse Israel. Uh, go curse the seed of, of Jacob. And uh, he's like, no, I cannot do that, you know, holier than thou. God will not let me. And so, and so Balak, uh, eventually, what happens is all of a sudden, um, Balak gives his daughters intentionally in marriage to the sons of Jacob. And then they, they intermix their seed, which God didn't want them to do. And you know what happened after that? They started worshiping their idols. Kind of like Solomon, right? Solomon, he got caught up with the women of the world. The next thing you know, he started worshiping idols. A guy who knew better, by the way. And so he married the, the marriage. So Balak, what, and so what we find out later in the New Testament is that what Balak did, and it's also, you, can, you have to discern it, also as you read the Old Testament, he beguiled uh, he gave he gave Balak Balaam gave gave Balak what he needed to know on how to deceive Israel. He's very sly, very very shrewd. Uh, so Balak is act or Balaam is acting all holier than thou. Oh, I would never, I would never curse God's people. But hey, Balak, hey, let me tell you something, Balak. Hey, if you really want to, you know, bring him down, this is what you need to do. And he does it, and it works, and God judges him. So God hates that because it led him into idolatry. And very subtly, by the way, like someone else that we know, the serpent, the devil. And so this guy's a prophet. Uh, he's a religious man. He's a prophet. And he works through a principality to bring God's people into the bondage of sin in idolatry. The sin specifically is that of idolatry. So I think most of you probably remember that story, don't you? You know, know that. So um, if not, you can go back and read that. I'm not, I don't want to get too... Uh, not that I don't want to, but for time's sake, I need to continue to move on. But it's good, important to understand what Jesus is having an issue with here. He's like, he's, he's having an issue with, uh, he's, he's, he's letting them know that where you dwell is where Satan's seat is. This is Pergamos. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. He says, hold fast, right, my name, and, 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 and you haven't denied my faith, okay? So he brings up Antipas, his martyr, and then he gets into 14. He says, there's the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and commit fornication. And so, um, so that, of course, that happened um, in the Old Testament. Numbers 25. Number, you can go read really about five or six chapters, Numbers 25 through 30. You get all of that story together. So I just kind of summarized it real fast. Uh, and, then, and then you have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So we're building on what we've already seen in verse 6. So having said that, okay, uh, knowing that, that historically there's a lot of things going on in Pergamos, um, based on what's going on here, there's, there's a Nicolaitan doctrine, there's idolatry happening, um, and, and, and God doesn't like the, di the idolatry, he doesn't like the Nicolaitan system, and he knows where Satan's seat is. Okay. So in your notes, uh, we see that under, we've got to understand the time frame. Let's just start off with that. So the church age of Pergamos, so we're fast forwarding now and looking at the church age, uh, begins at 325 A.D. with Constantine. That's to fill in the blank. Oh, I got PowerPoint, so forgive me. There we go. Uh, Constantine and the Council of Nicaea um, in the beginning of the Dark Ages is 500 A.D. So it goes about, uh, what, a hundred and... Uh, 75 years, if I'm counting right, right? 175 years. And, uh, and that's called the Middle Ages. You know, we used to call it the Dark Ages. So many historians refer to this time as, as a post-Nicaea period, Nicene period, I should say. 
And, uh, and I'm going to take a little time with this, uh, some of the key people. Uh, and so you may have to take some extra notes. If you're a note taker, uh, I'm going to give you a couple names that aren't on this list. We'll, we will talk uh, at some length about the first one, with it, which is Augustine. Uh, we have Athanasius, Athanasius, Athanasius I should say, uh, uh, Cyril, Christ, uh, Chris, Chrysostom, Chrysostom, Chrysostom. Um, Theodorat, Basil, uh, Gregory, Nazanai, I don't know, Nazianzen, Nazian, I don't know how to say that, Nazianzen, that's, there we go, Nazianzen, and Gregory uh, Nyssa. All right, so these are key people. We'll touch on these guys uh, and these popes, these popish people in a minute. Not all of them are bad, uh, and as a matter of fact, some of these guys are good, and, and so uh, but you have the time frame laid out here from about 354 with Augustine, who is the, the one who helps uh, get this doctrine established uh, for the Roman Catholic system. Uh, and, you, and it runs up here through about 400 A.D. with uh, Gregory uh, Nyssa and, and uh, Gregory Isaiazin, or however we say that. And so uh, there's also some names you might scratch down that are not in our notes and these are guys that are good guys. Uh, well, one of them there is in our notes. It's uh, John uh, Chrysostom. And then there's uh, a guy named Euphilus, U-F-I-L-U-S, uh, U-F-I-L-U-S. He's from about 311 to 383. And there's a guy named Patrick, which I think you've heard of Patrick. He lived from about 389, and they don't really know his, his time frame, so these are estimates with Patrick, but from about 389 to 461. Now, Patrick would not be uh, in your normal church history because a lot of because he's any he, any he really uh, because most church history that we read is Eurocentric anyway. Um, uh, you don't a lot of times Patrick's like what uh, whatever. Patrick's really instrumental because um, there's a, there's been a Bible believing remnant in the, in the in both Scotland and in Ireland and Great Britain really from the first century. There's just been a, a systematic, whether it's in, with the Welsh or up in Ireland, or, you know, God has just been working in those aisles forever uh, since the first century. So, um, and so Patrick uh, really becomes, you know, a key man in history because from that later you see, you know, even our King James Bible came from the Scots. Um, King, it was King Stuart of Scotland who became King James and that influence of... Uh, of Protestantism, though we're not Protestants, did help in getting us a pure word in English. So, so uh, we got to give credit to where credit is due. Anyway, so without getting too far afoot on that, um, I do want to just mention, I want to just touch on these guys, uh, John uh, uh, Chrys Chrysostom, um, and give you a little bit of background on him uh, in the time that we have remaining. <clears throat> so I, I, I did not give you my notes on this, I have notes on, on this, but I'm not going to hand them out for because they're too voluminous uh, to add to this existing outline I'm using. But uh, let me just say this. Our mission here at HBF, um, you know, is to equip the saints of God and the Word of God to accomplish the mission of God and the power of God. So what we do is make disciples. That's what we want to do. So by God's grace, um, that's, that's, you know, that's who we are. And God will continue to make sure that, uh, you know, he is faithful to his word and that we'll be, we'll be preserved blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crook and perverse nation. So that's what we want to do is hold fast the word of life. And uh, even though the serpent wants to beguile the church, we don't want that to happen. So Revelation 2.13, which we've read, he says here, I know thy works where Satan, uh, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied uh, my faith. Um, I'm going to get back to that, actually. Uh, that's, that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, let me talk about John Chrysostom. So he was born in Antioch of Syria, and he studied to be a lawyer. I'll get back to what I was just saying here in a little bit. But at the, at the age of 23, he gave up uh, that for the, to serve the Savior. He was called the Golden Mouth because of his eloquence in preaching, and he preached uh, uh, far and wide. His preaching was not only for its eloquence, known for its eloquence, but also for its substance. He preached against the vices of the Roman church, was against the idea of a state-run church, and would only yield to God and not uh, to personal comfort or w welfare. So in uh, 404, he was banished and died uh, on the way. And the last words that, he, that are recorded 
as he said, glory be to God for all things. So unfortunately, as happened uh, to others, his relics were gathered about 30 years after he died. And today the Roman Catholic Church claims John Chrysostom uh, as theirs, accrediting him with reinforcing doctrinal heresy espoused by the Roman Catholic Church, which could not be further from the truth. In reading their own writings, right, you just have to read what they wrote, it's very clear that he held no affinity for the bishops of Rome. He was not into what Rome was doing. And so we'll get into that a little bit more. So there were good guys like John from 347 to 407. There's Euphilus, which I mentioned a moment ago, 311 to 383. Uh, and, and I get excited about this guy because it was during the conquest of the Goths they brought captives back from Asia Minor. All right, So Asia Minor is where these seven churches are located. Among these captives uh, were the parents of uh, uh, Euphilus, and, uh, uh, who, was bo- uh, who was then born among the captors. And he grew up with, uh, with the Goths and learned the Christian ways like Patrick. When he was older, he became a missionary to his captors. Now, time doesn't allow me to get into this uh, in, in manus- I don't know, one of my cl- church history in the HBI. I talk quite a bit about the Goths because the Goths didn't even have a language. They created a, la- a written language. They had a, they had a dialect and a language. But uh, one of those dudes got saved, created a language and a Bible, and then God blessed them, and they were able to throw off Rome. And a lot of those Goth people ended up, uh, ended up getting re- uh, re- repatriated to the north and uh, really become the seeds for uh, Bible believers in the future. Ends up that uh, in like the, it was as late as, I think it was the 60s or 70s, they actually found in a church, uh, like in a tower somewhere, they found an original Goth translation of their Bible. I was so fired up when I read that, I couldn't believe it. And so, um, and so uh, that's really cool. So there's a Bible-believing remnant. When you think of the Goths, you think of Gothic, and you think of dudes, you know, Swinging habergens and you know, all of that, which they were some bad boys, by the way. Uh, but but they're, they're, God got a hold of them and uh, did a work in them, and they were liberty lovers, and they, they, they got autonomy and freedom and, and against all odds of that. I mean, they really were amazing. They took on the Romans and won. And so, uh, but that's another story. I just mentioned that because, um, because this guy grew up with the Goths, learned the Christian, learned the Christian ways from them, and then it wasn't, not, it wasn't from Rome because he, he had a background out of Asia. So again, the Pauline biblical doctrine was available. Uh, and so his beliefs, he first b- believed the Bible. Uh, that's the most important thing. He did not hold to the techniques and beliefs of the Roman church at all. In fact, he would have uh, had more problems with them, except Constantine II, the son of Constantine the Great, did not hold the same views as his father and gave freedom freedom to Arians. So the Arians were a group that was opposed to the Roman uh, church because of their teachings. The Goths were not Arians, but were classed as Arians, so they had freedom for a time. So history records that uh, Euphilus was uh, submissive to the leaders of Rome, though God gave him a military force that was able to defeat the Roman army. So Euphilus is credited, uh, it, was, it would appear that he understood uh, Romans 13, obviously, and 1 Timothy 2.2. And in his work, one of the main contributions was given the Goths a written language and Bible. And so the Goths, which I already said, so they had no written language prior to him. And he created an alphabet for them and translated the words, their words into writing, which was the first, first Gothic language um, uh, was written in a Bible. Just like a lot of what was developed in, our, in, in the English language was written in a Bible, in God's Word. That happens all the time, by the way. We're, we're seeing that. Um, where are we seeing that? Well, Albania already had a written language, so that's what I was thinking. But no, um, in some of the works I, w- I won't get into. I can't, I can't say where they are because they're, they're in places that are very serious. But, but just trust me on this one. There are works going on right now with Bible translation. People don't even have the language. They create the language so that they can, I mean, they have a language that they speak. They create a syntax, and, and then they create a Bible in that language. It's amazing. Uh, I have nothing but respect for people that do that. It's amazing. And so <clears throat> his impact, he had a great impact on the Goths. By the time the Goths reached into Italy, they were a Christian nation. So history records that uh, Euphilus followers were not, able, were not able to be influenced by the Roman Catholic Church because of their strong biblical beliefs. And the story of uh, Euphilus has a happy ending as Constantine allowed them to divorce Rome. They were able to get divorced, and his Goth followers left, for, uh, left Italy for uh, Mosea, which is modern-day Bulgaria. 
And, uh, and it's here where uh, Euphilus created a Goth alphabet and translated the scripture from Greek to Goth, not from Latin. And you can find a piece of his Goth Bible at the University Library in Uppsala, Sweden. And, uh, and so it was found in a cathedral stairway in 1971. Talk about the ministry of God preserving his word. Isn't that, I just think that's cool. I'm like, that is so awesome. And so, uh, and the third one I mentioned that is a good guy in that church age was Patrick, right? And you guys know about St. Patrick, but uh, of course he's another one that's been captured by Rome and turned into a saint. But the real story about Patrick isn't the legend that he rid Ireland of snakes. That's just fairy tales. Um, you know, uh, the tales that he, he stood on a hill and used wooden staff to drive the serpents into the sea and banishing them forever from the shores of Ireland. And that's all, you know, nonsense. Um, <clears throat> but there was one old serpent that did resist him. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, yeah, and it wasn't the one that, he, that got in a box and he slammed the lid shot on it. So um, another, there's another legend about him uh, to do with the shamrock, according to the legend, a pagan king of Ireland wanted an explanation of how one God could exist in three persons. And Patrick stooped down and picked up a shamrock, and he showed the king uh, how it had three leaves joined in one stem, and explains the Trinity uh, from this. And the king and all the subjects became Christians. So I have no idea about that, but um, but here's the reality of Patrick's life. His real name was Patricius, kind of like Patricio is a Mexican restaurant, uh, Patricius. And he grew up in Scotland in a Christian home. So he was actually Scottish. How many of you knew that? Probably a lot of you. No? Yeah. So Patrick was actually a Scotsman. Um, and, uh, and so his father was a deacon in a local church. So you're talking third century, fourth century, deacon in a local church up in Scotland, the northern part of the British Isles uh, today. So when he was 16, he was carried away captive to Ireland with many thousands of other men. Uh, in, his, in his own confessions, he stated that he was not saved when carried away. He said, I, Patrick, a sinner, the rudest and least of all the faithful and the most contemptible to great numbers, had uh, Calprinus uh, for my father, a deacon, son of the late uh, Potitus, the presbyter, which presbyter just means uh, uh, to be church, presbytery, who dwelt in the village of uh, Bonavon, uh, Tibernay, for he had a small farm at hand with the uh, place which, where I was captured. I was then almost 16 years of age. I did not know the true God and was taken to Ireland in captivity with many thousands of men according to their, uh, according with our deserts because he uh, walked at a distance from God and did not observe his commandments. So he talked about himself in the third person. So he's saying basically I got taken captive because I wasn't walking with God. So he was a slave in Ireland for six years and during that time he, he became... Uh, he came to know the one true God, and he became a man of prayer. He also learned to speak Irish, and the language barrier was a major cause of failure to missionary activity in Ireland before Patrick. Yeah, missionary activity before Ireland. Where do you think they got that? I would say probably from the ministry uh, left over from the Apostle Paul and the, and the church probably of Rome, since the Romans had eventually, was in, well, they had already invaded the British Isles. Had quite a time, by the way, uh, up there trying to take over those islands. Um, and so after six years, uh, he escaped and returned to Scotland. So he, get, he becomes a free man. And uh, how did he get back to Ireland then, if he was free and he was Scottish? That's a good question. So many years after his return to Scotland, um, there came a call to him to carry the gospel to the Irish. And he did not have a formal theological training and regarded himself as an unlearned man. But he was obedient to the calling of God. And unbelievably, the Irish had no warm welcome for him. Uh, and so they were not happy to see him come back. And so uh, they were not even waiting for him with open arms. In fact, he received much opposition from the Druids. And you probably have heard of Druids. They were satanic and pagan. Um, in 433, uh, uh, his ministry received a boost. He was con uh, contending for the faith and preaching the word of God at Terra. And as the result, uh, there was a king named King uh, Logarere, L-O-I-G-A-I-R-E, L-O-I-G-A-I-R-E, Logarere. That's how you'd say it, Logarere. Uh, he granted to toleration uh, for the Christians despite the fierce opposition from the heathen priesthood, which would be a Druid priesthood. And he continued to preach the word uh, across Ireland for 30 years. And he had the chance to preach the gospel to his old master who allegedly um, uh, 
uh, who, who alleged to have uh, burned himself in his house rather than hear the gospel, which I don't know if that's true or not. So the legacy of Patrick goes on. The ministry was outside of the influence of the Roman church. This is what's really important for us, regardless of what the current tradition says. The Roman church at that time wasn't even was barely in formation. I mean, it was just getting started, by the way, during this time. And the word of God was going forward. There was Long before there was a Roman church established in Rome, the word of God was already active, very active, around the world because they were taking the gospel where it needs to go. You can go to India, and they'll be talking about the ministry of Thomas down in uh, Kerala. Why? Because in the first century, there were seven churches at least in Kerala. And, uh, and so and Thomas is allegedly speared and was killed in Kerala, India. So these guys were getting it done even in the first century. So a couple centuries later, uh, the gospel had its influence. And so, um, and so Patrick was a preacher of the Bible. And so the Catholic Church didn't claim Patrick until uh, 200 years after he was dead. In addition, when Rome sent missionaries to Ireland during Patrick's mission, he left shortly after they, <clears throat> he left shortly after uh, he arrived because his message was not, they left shortly after he, they arrived because their message was not received. Patrick was a, a preacher of the Bible. He gave no authority to any other worldly uh, authority or tradition. He had no creeds other than the statement of belief taken from the Bible. He also stated that the Bible is the sole authority for founding of the Irish church, uh, which is very similar even to, um, oh gosh, well, he just died a few years ago. Ian, Ian Paisley, you guys know him? Uh, he was a Presbyterian preacher, but boy, was he a preacher. He was a, he was a, he was a dispensational, uh, Bible-believing, preaching machine, and he had no affinity for Rome either until his very last years, but uh, uh, he, was a, he was a fighting machine in Ireland. Go, just Google up some of his sermons and listen to him. You'll be edified, I'm sure. They don't make men like that anymore. He is something else. So, uh, but anyway, moving on. Patrick uh, put, put the words of God over... Uh, the teaching of men, and he was an advocate for strong families and that Christians should be founded um, with the family and the home as its strength. He did not teach uh, the practice of celibacy, so he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a Catholic. Uh, it's estimated that he had over 100,000 converts and started over 300 local indigenous churches in Ireland. He also started four missionary training centers, uh, and these are named Bangor, uh, Clonmacnoise, uh, Clon Clonmacnoise, Clonard, uh, Argma, and from these schools, many missionaries went to preach the gospel in Europe. In addition, these schools made copies of the scriptures for people. They had a Bible publishing ministry, and it was recorded that wherever he went, churches sprang up. In these churches, to guide the new converts, he established bishops, or what we would call pastors of local churches. There was no ecclesiastical hierarchy, right? No Nicolaitan system. It was God's model for the church structure. Nowhere in his teachings is there a mention of relics or the veneration of saints. And the church in Ireland was stable and true for about 600 years before the Roman church was able to take it over. And it did this in several ways. One was to make Patrick one of their own. And so just know, if I ever become a Roman Catholic saint, it's baloney. And uh, I don't think I'm going to have the influence of uh, Rome anyway. But it did this in several ways. It made him a saint, uh, made him a great hero in the Roman church. And then, of course, they had the forceful takeover of William the Conqueror in about 1066 A.D., so 1066 AD. So there was a respite. So there was quite a window there of, of peace because the word of God brings liberty, brings freedom. The preaching that we, you free people's souls, it, became, it freed the nation. So, um, and so he had a great impact. There's a gentleman named uh, Finian of Clonard who went into the next, right up past the next church, or church age, which we'll get into, but uh, there in, in, the, in Ireland. And uh, he converted through the legacy of uh, the preaching of Patrick. Uh, he He's also been claimed as a Roman Catholic, but based on his own writings, he ended up with 3,000 pupils uh, who would preach in the open air, and they actually preached expo expositionally like we do here uh, with the Word of God in, the, in that 400 A.D. era up to 500 A.D. And so it's because of a it was the residue, the discipleship of the ministry of Patrick. There's also a gentleman who goes from 521 to 597, uh, Columba. Uh, he's a disciple of Finian who went to... Scotland is a missionary, founded a missionary outreach. So we went from, from uh, Scotland to Ireland and Ireland back to Scotland. And he goes to Scotland and preaches from the, uh, uh, from the Isle of Iona, sent missionaries to northern England and uh, used the same Bible as Patrick. Uh, there's a, a fellow named Aidan uh, who died in 651, who's a disciple of Columba. 
Uh, he founded a missions base in the island of Lin Linsenfarn, and a movement spread through northern Europe. So they ended up affecting northern U Europe just a couple hundred years later. Col uh, uh, Columbanus, a uh, missionary who went as far as Switzerland preaching the gospel. Um, and, uh, and so they call them monasteries when you read the Schaff or uh, I got a, a book called Moyer, Great Christian Leaders by Moody Press, and it's published by Moody Press. Um, and they're just copying what they've read. They really weren't monasteries. Um, that's just what they call them because Romans wrote them. Uh, but Columba never worked against the Roman church, but he is noted for destroying paganism everywhere he went. History records he literally established schools on the very location of pagan worship sites after preaching and converting the villages. And, um, and uh, a letter that was sent to Pope, Gre Pope Gregory says, we, we Irish who inhabit the extremities of the world are the disciples of St. Peter and St. Paul and of the other apostles who have written under the dictation of the Holy Spirit. We receive nothing more uh, than the apostolic and, and evangelical doctrine. Pardon me if I have said some words offensive to pious ears. The native liberty of my race has given me that boldness. Uh, with us, it is not the person, it is, it, it is the right which prevails. And so history doesn't record uh, Pope Gregory's response. But Pope Gregor Gregory is listed there at the end of your list uh, in, in our notes. So uh, they were not very happy with these uh, free-loving Irishmen out preaching the Word of God in northern and in, in parts of Europe because uh, they didn't submit to the Roman Church. Okay, so uh, let me pause here and take a drink. Throw that in with the list of names here because those are kind of auxiliary names that people aren't going to throw in your normal church history list because Bible believers are like, whatever, you know. Uh, what's really focused on here? And what we're tracking is uh, Satan's work as well. But I want you guys to know that God is alive and well. And he is working to get the gospel where it needs to go on time in every church age, just like he, he does in every dispensation. Okay, so let's talk about understanding. Let me pause there. Any questions on that? All right, so let's talk about the, the uh, text, understanding the text. Consider the meaning of the name Pergamos. So it means much marriage. And uh, that's why I took a little time to talk about that Balak and Balaam and the, the idolatry that was occurred among God's people through mixing marriage with pagans and getting them to worship idols. Uh, so this name uh, supernaturally represents the characteristics of the, per uh, the period, and I'm going to show you that as we go. Um, it is a time in church history where the church is married to the world, right? The church gets married to the world, very much like you see today, right? We could apply, apply that pra practically I just watched a, today, I, was, I ran one of our videos for the Bible publishing uh, conference we're having coming up in uh, September 19th through the 22nd, by the way. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, it's a commercial. And, uh, and so, uh, after that, some preacher comes up, man, and I'm telling you, I had to turn it off. I was just like, this guy it was like a salesmeister. I'm like, I could watch this on, you know, Tony Robbins. So, anyway, it was just not in the Word of God. It was just motivational speaking. I'm sure it was good, but it wasn't biblical, and uh, and so I turned it off. But uh, man, we could the church is pretty married to the world today. I will say that for sure. So the the, the deviations uh, of the um, of the Ephesus church period began to develop in the doctrines. So there's deviations and that were developed into the doctrines of the Smyrna church period, which developed into Satan's counterfeit church. All right, so I just said something there. Let me just take a moment and massage that. So there's deviations of the Ephesian church, the first church. Uh, remember, we talked about the deeds of the Nicolaitans and the Nicolaitan system. And then it, it's a, then it, it ended up developing into doctrines of the Nicolaitans, right, at the Smyrna church period, which ended up de developing into Satan's counterfeit church. And uh, this, is, this imposter becomes accepted as the true church or the holy Catholic church. Um, and so uh, this imposter becomes accepted as the true church or the ho holy Catholic church. That's your blank there. So it's established itself as authoritative and believes it stands in the place of Jesus to dispense salvation. It believes it's the only church that can understand and teach the Bible. Now today, you're, it's a, it's, at least in the United States, it's a much meeker, milder church. And some Vatican II, right, knocked some of the edges off so, because it doesn't fly in America. Um, but 
just stay tuned, and uh, it will it will pick up soon, um, like it used to be. So it's interesting how God uh, begins his this his letter. And so, let me see. All right, there are we there? Am I? I'm sorry, guys. I'm behind. So he begins his letter in Revelation two twelve, and he talks about the sharp two edged sword. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath, hath the sharp uh, sword with two edges. And so, <clears throat> um, of course, we know Hebrews four twelve tells us that, that that is our Bible, right? He is a sharp two edged sword. Let's just look at it real quick. Hebrews chapter. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. I've been saying we all know it, but maybe we don't. Let's just take a moment. You should have this memorized if you don't. So, for the word of God is quick, right? Meaning it's, 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 it brings to life. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. No doubt about it. It's the word of God. It's a sharp two-edged sword. He says this is a time when people have removed themselves, and there's no biblical authority. There's no biblical authority. The ath- so if there's no biblical authority, where's the authority placed? Where? Satan. Satan, yeah, but practically, man, it gets put in the priesthood. It gets put in these leaders, and we'll, we'll look at that. So this, but before we get into that, uh, I want to focus a little bit on this, this church dwelling where Satan dwells in verse 13. So I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now this is important. These pieces are important because uh, Satan has a seat, right? And it's a throne, as, as uh, Ron pointed out earlier, right? It's a throne uh, from where he rules, and Satan's primary operation is religion, and his place in Pergamos is no different. It's a Babylon mystery religion. All right. So I know some of you are like, wait a minute. I just was listening to Pastor Grace, maybe not in our church, maybe some others, if you're LFF folks listening. And he just said at the conference that mystery Babylon religion is, is uh, going to be found in Rome or in uh, Jerusalem. I think there's truth in both of those statements, but I can, I'll can i have to rectify that at another date. But I can tell you this for sure. Mystery Babylon religion is found in Rome, and the evidence is very clear in history. All right? So uh, the Babylonian mystery religion came to Pergamos in 133 B.C. All right? So this is not just some random date. And, uh, and so in 133 B.C., before Christ... Okay, get that down. This was already on the move. This was a pagan religion. Babylonian religion. Was, it had a priesthood. And it, it was moved um, from Babylon to uh, Rome in 133 A.D. And so when, when he says there, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even Satan, where his seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. The seat and the dwelling place of Satan is relocated at this time. Uh, Satan moves his seat, his throne of power, from Babylon to Pergamum. B.C. Did I say A.D.? It's B.C. Does it, is it not? Yeah, it says B.C. on the notes. Yeah. So before Christ, you're like, what? Yeah, before Christ is even born, 133 years before he is born, there's a Babylonian religion because it goes all the way back to Nimrod, right? And so we'll get into that here in a minute. And so uh, Satan moves the seat from Babylon to Pergamum. And I can't stress how important this is for us to understand the truth behind these words in Revelation because the seat is the political place of power. It is in these words we find both historic and prophetic significance between Satan's false religious system, which is Babylonian religion, and the power structure he uses to control the kings of the earth. The move of Atlas, and so if you want to study this, look up Atlas, A-T-T-A-L-U-S, Atlas. He's a priest king of Babylon in 133 B.C. Atlas, A-T-T-A-L-U-S, the priest king of Babylon. So Babylon, that ancient city of Babylon... The one you read about in, in uh, Daniel has a priest king named Atlas. 
in 133 BC, um, he moves the priesthood from Babylon to Pergamum, which is what we're talking about, Pergamum, Pergamus. Now, this is written historically in um, 90 AD, 96 AD, with the revelation of John. At that time, it's still there. So you're talking um, 133 plus 90, so 223 years, roughly, a little give or take a few. And so, and so uh, it's still there. It's still in operation. And so what, how did that happen? Well, Babylon was invaded by Persians. And, uh, and it's critical to the history of the world and the movement of Satan. The, his, the historian Justin records that Atlas willed his kingdom and title to the Romans. Atlas was given the title Magian, M-A-G-I-A-N, in Latin. We'll get to that. I'm going to look at that here in a little bit. But that's where he gets the title in 366 A.D., a Babylonian priest took sole right to the bishopric and became the Latin form of the phrase Pontifex Maximus. So his title that was given Magian ends up becoming the title in 366 in the age of the Pergamus Church in Rome becomes Pontifex Maximus. And if that's familiar to you, that's because to this day the Roman Pope is called the Pontiff. That's where that comes from, directly from the title given to a Babylonian priest king that transitioned the title of Pergamum from, per, uh, from Babylon, the priesthood from Babylon to Pergamum because of the invasion of the Persians. All right, you guys tracking with me so far? All right, so hopefully. So you may say, so what? Was I got to do with the price of tea in China? So Babylonian Magian or Roman Pontifex Maximus spanned the gap between mortals and Satan. What did the Babylonian priest king do? He spanned the gap. This, isn't, this is before Christ, okay? Before Christ even came to this earth, there was a priest and a priesthood that was believed to span the gap between man and God, or Zeus, or whatever you want to call him. And, uh, and so this title gets transferred uh, to Pergamum. At this time, in, 70, or in 90 AD, 96 AD, it's in Pergamum. But it's going to move. Originally, Pontifus Maximus was the high priest of the pre-Christian Roman religion, a distinctly religious office under the Roman Republic. It gradually became politicized until beginning with Augustus, who's listed in here, it was sub, uh, subsumed into an imperial office. So today, Pontifus Maximus is one of the titles of the Roman Catholic Pope today. The pagan origins of the office of Pontiff are well documented in secular history. In ancient Rome, the College of Pontiffs, or Collegium Pontificum, was a body whose members were the highest-ranking priests of the polytheistic state religion. We're talking in the previous church age. So from, from uh, uh, 100 AD, let's say, when the pagan Roman priesthood was called the, pontif uh, the, uh, the, pont the Collegium Pontificum. So you had a bunch of popes. You know what these guys were? Nicolaitan-type people. But these weren't even Christians yet. Okay, so these are just pagan priests called Collegium Pontificum. Um, they were the highest ranking priests of the polytheistic state religion. Because Romans, as you know, were polytheistic. They, they believed in worshiping multiple gods. The problem with Christians is we said Jesus is the one true God. Still the problem today. That gets us in trouble all, wherever we go. That's why one of our teams had rocks thrown at us by a Catholic priest in a pagan culture in India. You can't top that. So we go preaching in the street in a, in a polytheistic culture like India outside of Mumbai, and who comes out and stones you? The Catholic priest. So he just, he's right in there with the mix. Crazy. So the power of Pergamum was moved to Rome, and the entire world was run from the Regia Temple, which you, I wish I had. In my Revelation study, I got pictures of all this. I got pictures of the seed of Satan, which is replicated in Germany right now. You can go, go look it up. And the uh, seat of Satan is, 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 there's a scale model sitting there with the, with the altar. On, by the way, it's the altar of Zeus. Zeus is sitting on that seat. And, and uh, God says, no, that's not the altar of Zeus. That's the seat and synagogue of Satan. And so that was a replica from Pergamum. It's in the German, uh, I think it's in the German museum. And so at any rate, moving on, the power of Pergamum was moved to Rome and the entire world was run from the, the Regia, R-E-G-I-A. You look that up. And they're still in the ruins of, of, uh, of Rome. 
the Regia still exists, the building in which we're talking about, where the Collegium Pontific, uh, uh, Pontifex was. Uh, and so, or Pontificam, I should say, or Pontificum, I think is how they said it. So the, re, the Regia is where those guys would meet, the pagans. Um, and so <clears throat> um, the entire Roman Forum was constructed around the Regia building. And I don't have the slide in this. I don't think I, I don't have it in this series. I've changed up my teaching notes for y'all. So in my old church history, I have a picture of that for you. So I apologize for not putting it up. Um, but you guys can find it. R-E-G-I-A temple. It's a Regia temple. Still there today. Still in the ruins. You can see it. The building's still standing. All right. So um, there's a popular book called The Church of Irresistible Influence. It's not popular anymore. It's old. But it was all about bridge building. I was reading that book as a young church planner. And man, I was also studying Revelation at the same time. And I, th- I took that book and I'm like, I'm out. I'm not on the church. I'm not building bridges. So I, and you guys, Chris and Kathy were here. I preached a whole series. I don't know if you remember this. I can barely remember it now because it's been a long time ago. But I preached a, one of our vision conferences. This came to me. I'm like, I got up and I started preaching crossing rivers without bridges. Because in the Bible, you don't find anyone building a bridge. But you know what the job of the Pope is, the Pontifus Maximus, whether he's a Babylonian priest or a supposedly Christian, he is the chief bridge builder. That's what his name, that's what his name means, his chief bridge builder. Get in your Bible and study it. Are there any chief bridge builders in the Bible? Not a one. When God wants people to cross rivers, he just says, I'm going to open it, and you're going to go through miraculously under my power. So from that time on, I've been like, Lord... We're just going to cross rivers without bridges. Forget building bridges. But there's a whole book that came out around early 2000s. Uh, or, let's see, we started in 02. Yeah, so about 02, 03, whatever. And it was called the, the, uh, the Church of Irresistible Influence. And it was all based on building bridges. And, man, I took that book and I'm like, forget it. <laughs> We're just going to, when you're a baby church and you don't have any resources anyway, we can't afford to build bridges. We're just going to go up to the water and say, God, open it up, you know. Because that's really what God wants. He wants people of faith. But anyway, so, um, <clears throat> and so uh, here's the blow-by-blow account of how this process took place historically, because I've got to move on. It takes us past 500 A.D., so we're going to fast forward, but it will serve as a template for the rest of our time in church history. So Satan's seat was consolidated and moved to Rome under Constantine, which we're going to talk about, in 316 A.D., all right, so when did Pergamum no longer become the seat of the power? Well, in, in 316 AD, when Constantine took the title of the Church of Rome uh, and was given, it, was, it gave him uh, the Supreme Pontiff in 378 AD. So this is a process. It didn't just all happen in one move. But uh, so Constantine, when he becomes a Christian, quote, quote, Christian, turns the Regia into a, a Christian supposedly, priesthood. But that doesn't really get formalized until 378 A.D. All right. On Christmas Day, though, in 800 A.D., a fellow named Pope Leo III placed a crown on the head of the emperor of the Western Empire, Charlemagne, and declared he was the crowned, he was crowned by God as emperor. And this marked a strategic turn in the strategy of Satan concerning his seat and synagogue. Now, the kings of the earth would come to the seat of Satan to be anointed by the pontiff, the vicar of God. And at that point, that's when the, the, the kings of, the, of Europe, the kings of the earth, so to speak, would come and be, uh, you know, you either came and worked with the Pope or he'd check six Charlemagne on you and he would come with his armies and put you out of business. So European monarchs are built upon the power and authority of the seat and the synagogue of Satan. The USA is one of the few world powers since Charlemagne to break free completely from the power of the pontiff. That's why in the United States for so many years, uh, there was a concern about allowing a, a Roman Catholic past, or a pre, uh, president to be in the White House because of the influence Rome would have upon that principality, which wasn't an un, an unfounded if you actually know history. Church history or not, just world history, that's actually not a... There's a reason why people were legitimately concerned. Now, if I said that today, they would shame you. Um, you know, but the reality is there's, there's a historical reason for that. It's very clear. And so Vatican City is the only city-state represented um, in the United Nations. Historically, they have had a voting power. Uh, they didn't have voting power, but now they do. Uh, I think it goes back and forth. And all of this ties uh, into church history's current events today. And so um, I need to, I want to pull for you, without getting into too much more on this, 
the date when it came from Babylon to Rome, or from Pergamum to Rome. And I don't have it here, so my bad. I will get that to you guys. I got it in my other notes. So, But moving on to our notes. So let's talk about the Babylonian mystery religion. So how did all this work out? So uh, the, uh, Bab- the, the mystery religion came to Pergamos in 133 B.C., and the Babylonian priesthood was active when John wrote Revelation. So there was already a Babylonian priesthood active uh, while John was writing this in 96 A.D. So there's a brief overview uh, of what was going on. And I think you have all this in your notes. Nimrod, where did this Babylonian religion come from? Well, we we'll go all the way back to Genesis, right? Chapters 10 and 11. Nimrod married Samarius and founded the Babylonian uh, mysteries, mystery religion. That's where it comes from. Um, they had <clears throat> a son named Tammuz. And you can go to Ezekiel 8.14 as a Bible reference. Ezekiel 8.14, it's not in your notes. And you're going to find that uh, in Ezekiel, they, God is angry. He's, he writes it down. They are in Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem is so corrupt that they are weeping, it says, for Tammuz. So Tammuz does appear in their Bible. In Ezekiel chapter 8 uh, and verse uh, 14. And so they're weeping for Tammuz. And, so, and they also made cakes to Ashtaroth. There's all kinds of uh, female deity problems, but we'll, we'll get into that as we go. It was said that he was conceived by a sun ray while Samarius was still a virgin. Uh, and his birthday is December 25th. Imagine that. And so Samarius was worshipped by many. Um, or by, uh, yeah, by many. Her statues were erected with her holding her baby. And worship included chants, black robes, candles, beads, and incense. And so in Genesis 11, this religion spread across the entire world, right? Because, well, you can find this in every culture, which is what's in your notes. I think you got the pictures, right, in your notes? Okay. Isn't it true that they say that Tammuz was also uh, resurrected from the dead? Yes, Tammuz was resurrected from the dead. The whole thing has been the devil was way ahead trying to corrupt the truth. Yeah, it's just historical knowledge. It's kind of like the Assyrian Empire, you know, it's just, it is. Because so many, I mean, really so many world religions, pagan religions are based on it. You know, even Ra, the sun god, that whole thing, very similar system. But you have, uh, I can't even pronounce this, uh, Ankhness, Mary, the son of Pepe, Pepe, uh, that's one. You see the the mom and the, 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 the sun there, and uh, you have in Cyprus, you have Madonna, uh, I don't know how to say that, Gynion, goddess of mercy, uh, Matrika from Tanesra of India. So that's why you can easily have synchronicity uh, with uh, these statues and, the, and Madonna and all that when you go to places like India. Um, uh, you have Yasoda and Krishna. Now that's an interesting one in, in uh, number five there. Mother and son from 2000 to 8, 1850 B.C. That's an old ancient one. You have uh, Mexico, uh, you know, Jalisco. Uh, they have a similar thing there. The Mayans had one. Uh, the, in Mexico, Colimo. Uh, the, in Greece, they had one. They had one, uh, sun goddess of Arena. I'm not sure where that one was from. And, of course... Virgin Mary, but it wasn't the real Virgin Mary and the Madonna. You also, at the bottom, you have Samar- uh, Samarimus and Tammuz, um, which is the one, what we're talking about. In India, you got Indrana, and you got Isis and Horus, which is in Egypt, with the sun, which basically, the, the, what's sitting on top of his, his head, that sun, is also what the Eucharist is taken from in the Roman Catholic pagan religion, because it's tied to Alexandria, Egypt. So, Interesting. Now, I could go on and on about that um, and talk for, we only got five more minutes, so we're not going to do that. That's a whole other Bible study. I I don't want to get too far afoot. Let me pause here. How many of you have never seen this stuff? So most of you already, some of you haven't. Okay, a few of you haven't. Some of you have. It may be old hat to you, but 
Um, there is all kinds of information. Uh, there's also a book that many people, Hislop's book, I uh, forget the name of it. Nathan, do you remember the name of it? Babylon. Yeah. What's it called? To Babylon. To Babylon. So Hislop uh, interchanged some, some names, and so that book has been discredited, and people who are, um, I will say that, but you know what? It's still edifying, and it's very, uh, it's accurate. Everything about it is accurate other than he messed up some names. He interposed Assyrian gods with Babylonian gods name-wise. I, I, if, if you want a scholarly book, okay, you need to have the names correct, and they need to be attributed to the right, uh, the right places. So I'll give that to his critics. However, it doesn't negate the, the historical reality, which we can see very clearly just in picture form, <laughs> of, this, of this system that Satan has been working in pagan religion since, since Nimrod. Okay, so, uh, and it's, it's also well documented in secular history anyway. So, so it doesn't mean that everything Hislop said was bad. So for those of you that, that, that didn't know that, I used to quote Hislop, and then I found that out, so I, I quit co- quoting him. So um, let me just kind of throw something else out that's not in our notes regarding this system. So what's going on with Rome uh, let me just kind of, because we only have a few minutes left. I, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to park the car here. Uh, and so we'll pick up next week right here. Um, well, um, let me just run through this, because we've talked about this. And I'll, uh, maybe next week I'll pick up where, what I want to tell you now. So the, the, let's just run through this and get going. So the Roman pseudo-Christians are persecuting anyone who doesn't conform to their religion. That's what's going on. In verse 13, it says, I know thy works and where Satan dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou hast fa- hold fast um, my name and hast not denied the faith, even in th- those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. There's not, this is the first mention of martyr in Revelation. And um, it's, in, it's in Pergamos. So there's still true believers that are holding to their faith, not only there in Pergamum, but in this time in church history. There's going to be names like uh, uh, Paterans, Anabaptists, Dantonists come from that time. Uh, they aren't killing themselves, uh, or I'm sorry, they're not calling themselves Christian because by that time, Christians are the ones who are doing the killing. And so you always hear those per- people that say, you know, Christians start all the wars. Well, there's some truth to that. I think you were talking about that, discipleship. So that's true. That's why it gets confusing. Okay, so this church age is dealing with those that hold the doctrine, right? The teaching of Balaam. We talked about that, so I'm going to run through that quickly. It's interesting to note that it's during this period that transubstantiation, that's a big word, transubstantiation is introduced in this, in this period of church history. Somebody, does anybody want to quickly tell me what is transubstantiation? Yeah, Matt. In the, Sarah, in the Roman Catholic Mass, uh, when they ring the bell, that, that wafer uh, becomes, magically becomes the literal body of Christ, and that blood in the, in the golden cup becomes the blood of Christ. Now, of course it doesn't, but that's, that's the literal teaching. So you become a, uh, at that point, you become a, what do you call it? When, a cannibal. And uh, you eat the body and the blood of Christ. And so... Um, Exactly. That's what transubstantiation is. So the priest has the power, the mystical power, by the way, uh, to turn that, that, that wafer into, which is a replication of the sun god, uh, Horus, uh, and turn that sun into the sun. And you eat that, and then that, that becomes the blood. That fermented wine becomes the blood of Christ. So Balaam, uh, so, okay, so what is the doctrine of Balaam? So I've already touched on this. Uh, Balak wanted Balaam to curse Israel, right? We talked about that. Uh, Balaam couldn't curse Israel because God wouldn't let him. And so Balaam found a way for Israel to curse themselves. Pretty slick. So he taught Balak, uh, what we find out is he taught Balak to cause the women of Moab to intermarry with the Jews. And so they intermarried with the Jews. Much marriage, remember that's the name of Pergamos. And the Jews began to worship the gods, small g, of their wives, and God judged them for it, which was exactly what Balak was after. So Balaam is a type of teacher that wants to gain success by uniting religions. 
much marriage. And so Brian gets saved in 1987, 1988, the initiative to uh, come to America. They have a huge, ec- at New Orleans down there in the Superdome, they have a huge ecumenical movement. And then after that, Pope John II uh, comes out with a, a whole youth movement. They have a big, big rallies all over the United States, out in Denver, Colorado. And after that, they start bringing everybody together through contemporary Christian music, by the way. That's why Matt Marr is an unrepentant Roman Catholic, and he unfortunately has some of the best songs on the radio. I hate to say that. Uh, His songs are more biblical than most of the people who would say they're biblically born again have some of the most wishy-washy, pathetic music there is. And, And then you got, not all of them, but some, then you got a guy like Matt Marr who's happy to, Roman, hey, we'll spin his stuff out on the, they don't care if he's lost, as long as he makes some money. And so, as far as I know, he's still believing the Eucharist is getting changed every week at Mass. And so, anyway, just kind of, that stuff drives me crazy, as you can tell. I'm sorry to ruin your day on Matt Marr, because he does, I know his songs are catchy and they, they're good, but um, it's, it's pathetic. That's the world we live in. Let's marry it all together and see what comes out. Well, it's going to come out to the Antichrist, for goodness sake. That's what I just preached on Sunday. All right, so moving on. Uh, so, the, so Pergamus Church is also dealing with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, which you covered. What was once the deeds in verse 6 of the Nicolaitans has now become the doctrine, the teaching. And during this period, a priest class is officially introduced. And this takes us into the Dark Ages, and, uh, which is in your notes. The Word of God is then removed. And you got a reference there, Mark 12. We're not going to look that up for time's sake, but we can come back next week. We'll touch on this before I move on to the next section about Pergamum. Uh, the only way to stop this heresy is through the sharp two-edged sword of God's Word, which, by the way, uh, does the work. And we see that in verses 16 and 17 of the text. Uh, he says, Repent, else I will come unto thee quickly and with a fight, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The Word of God does the work. And uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So in a time of ecumenical movements, what should you hold fast to? The Word of God. The Word of God. The sword of his mouth. The only way to stop that heresy is to hold fast to the faithful word as you've been taught. So during this time, the true Bible believers are standing against false doctrine by standing on or in the Word of God. And um, God, uh, God... promises to give them uh, to eat of the hidden manna, which is the word of God, and he also promises to give them, uh, them a white stone, a sign that, of course, they're not guilty. Okay, oops, I went too far. All right, so when we get together next week, I'm gonna, I, I have a little bit more I want to touch on just regarding the courtship, the proposal, the ceremony, the consummation, the honeymoon, the children, and, uh, and, uh, and some of the things that are going on around the, this process because how this marriage comes together. And then I want to talk to you a little about, about the Council of Nicaea and the creeds and a few more key names before I move into the marriage council. It'll all go hand in hand very nicely. So I'm kind of glad I paused there. Okay, let me take a breath. <sighs> all right. So I've, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, and, uh, and I'm really just like skipping a rock. I mean, this is not, this is so, that's why I went to this outline that I have here. Because my other notes go deeper and my HBI notes go even deeper. Commercial for HBI for some of y'all. If you want to get an HBI, whether a class or a full load, uh, your time is now. So we'll sign up. D1 is a prereq, D2 is a prereq, and then you can enter uh, HBI. So uh, we got we got a good class coming up this year, good numbers. I think we got about 10 students or something like that. So, um, so praise the Lord. But anyway, um, any questions or clarifications? One date that I'm missing is when, uh, when the, uh, the uh, 133 BC, they, did, they moved it to Rome. And I do have that date documented, but I go, it's not in these notes. So I'll try to find that. I'll probably just email it or something uh, or bring it back next week. So um, if any, does anyone know it? Ron, do you remember? I gave it out in HBI, I know. So... All right, so uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and uh, let's apply this practically. So what's the lesson today? Um, the lesson is that you don't want to be beguiled uh, into, into allowing yourself uh, to get into idolatry. And anything we worship other than Jesus Christ is idols. Those pho- these phones, wherever mine is, these phones, man, you can get into idolatry right here. 
Images. That's all it does is put images in your face till you're no longer focused on the image of Christ in your Bible. So make sure, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be deep, deep, dark, you know, nasty stuff. It could just be distractions. And the God of this world, he's smart. He's sly. He's slick. Make sure this book is the priority. The words of God's mouth. That's got to be the key. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, the fact that the way this kind of concluded is we were talking about the sharp two-edged sword. Lord, that is, the, that is the weapon that you tell us to hold fast to in Ephesians, and there's a reason for that. Those seven churches were started out of Ephesus. The Word of God is the key. That is how we stand, and our foundation is Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would gird up the loins of our mind. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to understand uh, the movement, uh, not only that you have made through history, but also how Satan is counterfeiting everything that you do. And Lord, uh, thank you for revealing to the church mystery Babylon religion. And this will find its way all the way into Revelation 17, Revelation chapter 18. And Heavenly Father, you're, you're giving us pieces of things that have yet to happen and still being fulfilled. We're still actively engaged in this battle. And it's important, Lord, to know uh, Lord, you've shown us in the Bible the movement of Satan in time so that we can be wise in our practical uh, life today. And Lord, if, if I was to just take all of these things and, and then distill them down to the practical news that we're going to watch today or tomorrow, Lord, it would be very evident that Satan is still working. He is still, there are people who are still claiming the promises of Israel. There's still a priesthood. There's still uh, people that, that will uh, you know, be ushered into power with the Antichrist and be married. Uh, Lord, there, all of these things are going to come to pass just as you said. And uh, Lord, if we know what's going on, Lord, we need to make sure that we keep ourselves pure. Keep ourselves from all that and stay focused on crossing rivers without bridges. Lord, we don't need the chief bridge builder. We need the Lord Jesus Christ who, scanned, who, uh, who has, who has uh, given us entry, who is our propitiation, uh, who has allowed us into the very throne room of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so thankful for the shed blood of Christ. We're thankful for the word of God who was incarnate, who died on the cross for our sins. We're thankful for the word of God you preserved in our language to renew our minds, Lord, to, to let, let us know your will from your word so that we can accomplish your mission and your power for your glory and your honor. Lord, I pray, God, that we'd hold fast to the faithful word as we've been taught, and Lord, that we wouldn't be beguiled uh, by the, the, the work of the devil. And Lord, that we just thank you and praise you for giving us your play, the playbook and knowing um, all the moves, not only what you're doing, but what the adversary is doing, so we can stand fast in the faithful word as we've been taught. We thank you now, and we praise you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you've got any questions,